Today is Tuesday, January 17th. Oh, you know, 2017 has barely begun and it's already shaping up to be a golden year for fake news. Yeah, we're literally being showered with it. But here <laughs> is some probably not fake news. <laughs> probably. We make no guarantees. First up, a little bit of meta. Not really very many corrections from last week or not really any corrections from last week. The, there's some uh, clarification around like the Ryzen chipset thing, but I'm just going to wait until Ryzen's actually out to see how motherboard manufacturers have configured the resources on the motherboard to do stuff. Our store is operational. If you missed our video on the RAID thing, you should totally check out the RAID. It's sort of the, the, the zeroth video on our storage server, our storage solution. We had a lot of fun shooting that. That was actually, I get to ride the rack like a skateboard, so that was fun. <laughs> you should never use a two-post rack for what we did, but it's fine. It's it's probably fine. OSHA is, is not cool with that. Yeah. Oh, oh, there's, don't even want to talk about the OSHA angles for any of that. It'll just beep, gone, nothing, I don't know. Follow-up, yeah. Consumer Reports retested the MacBook Pro, which is kind of unheard of. Consumer Reports never retests anything. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe they would, but I, I don't think they would do it this quickly or make, or, or it would be like a news story if they did. Now, the problem was not the batteries, so they say, the problem was Safari. So when <laughs> Consumer Reports does testing, they turn off all caching, which makes sense. They want pure performance, and caching would poison the well for that the second and third time you test it. So it turns out when you do that in Safari, <laughs> it kills the battery. <laughs> <laughs> Safari is just like, let me rebuild that for you. Well, But it was a bug in Safari. And so you know, I guess any web developer probably could have told you that Safari is the oh. root of all evil. <laughs> oh, God. It's the new Internet Explorer. <laughs> it really is. Uh, you know, OS 10, I don't know, not to go get off too much on a tangent. It's like, I really, really want to like the Unix underbelly of OS 10, but or Mac OS now, I guess it is. But Apple has really got to update their core libraries. And I know I can use Brew, but come on. Come on. Really? Come on. It's it's fine. And in another follow-up, Bitcoin and China. Uh, China is struggling and we've talked about this in the past that's why this is a follow-up they're struggling with money leaving the country <laughs> going Boy, to vancouver british columbia if not rapidly Bitcoin. rapidly yeah <laughs> the, the canadian real estate market is almost completely fueled by chinese buyers which is hilarious there's some of that in california too like uh and maybe uh oregon i don't know but like these amazing mansions are all being bought up by the chinese because they want money out of the country well china doesn't like that and so in turn China doesn't like Bitcoin. <laughs> and if you're a Bitcoin investor, you've seen a lot of volatility in 2017, mostly because of this. So the Chinese have begun investigating all of the exchanges. And then, although the margin, uh, the uh, exchanges announced it, it wasn't the government that announced it, but you kind of get the idea that somebody got a phone call. No more margin trading on hmm. the really big exchanges. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And it did cost, you know, Bitcoin a uh, hundred bucks or so this past week. Wow, yeah. Well, I thought it I thought it dipped down to like 822 at its lowest point or something like that. I think like it that. got below 8 at wow. the worst. Yeah, yeah but, so that's quite a bit of volatility over a peak of what, over 1,000? Yeah, but it did rebound pretty quickly. Uh, these are stopgap measures. They usually don't work very well. We've talked about Gresham's Law before, and they need to fix <laughs> their monetary policy and their currency and not beat down the Bitcoin exchanges. But if you're a Bitcoin investor, you know, if you're brave... By the dip, I guess. <laughs> Speaking of nation states behaving badly, uh, there have been a lot of people that maybe have been getting this notice from Google. This is kind of a developing story, but it's like government backed attackers maybe trying to steal your password notice from Google. It's like your security's at risk. Just you know, keep Microsoft Word up to date or open Microsoft Word documents with Google Docs. Ah, uh, this is yeah, it's <laughs> weird. Is this Google's response to like the little smarmy messages from Windows 10 that pop up? It's like, <laughs> did you know that Edge is better than Chrome and for various reasons? Now, I've gotten the uh, the Gmail warning where it's like, hey, someone accessed your account from China. <laughs> <laughs> is that normal? You might want to reset your password or they tried to, you know. So uh, maybe it's that, but in Microsoft Word format? Uh, I don't know. Somebody emailed them a document or something, but... Uh, this is kind of a developing story. We don't really have a lot of details yet. There are a lot of people that saying that this is faked, but there are also a lot of people that are posting the same screenshot, like credible people that are saying, hmm, it seems like a nation state is maybe trying to attack this or maybe trying to access this or trying to do something with this. We don't, 
We don't really know. So you'll probably hear about that story again next week in a follow-up. But if you get that message from Google, let us know in the comments or whatever. And let us know what the what your Word document was about. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I guess uh, I guess Google doesn't want to reveal the special sauce of how they know that what they know because then the the, the you know whoever's <laughs> doing that just gets better. <laughs> or they reveal that they're reading the Word document. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you would be targeted by nation states, do you really? I mean, should you be using Gmail? I don't. Oh I don't, my god. Well, we've seen like the Hillary email server and all that stuff. You know, they're passing Word documents back and forth. Well, so but that raises an interesting point though. Because Hillary's email server is definitely decidedly worse than Google, especially with like two-factor authentication. But if you're running your own encrypted mail server and doing it correctly, it seems like that would be better than, than, than Gmail. Yeah, probably. It's an interesting. It's an interesting situation, I guess. It's like the day that you set up your mail server is fine, but if you don't maintain it and keep it up to date and you know do everything, this is going to be a recurring theme in this episode. This is going to be a security-heavy episode, I think. But, uh, you know, the recurring theme of not updating and not updating biting you in the ass sort of becomes a thing, I guess. I think she also, like, purposely hamstrung her technical people. It's like, no, I'm not putting up with that. Make it easy. <laughs> easy and or insecure. Right. It's fine. Well, Tom Wheeler, our old friend from the FCC, the current chairman of the FCC, is on his way out. And in his, you know, sort of retirement, quotation marks around retirement, speech uh he's saying uh, please don't undo net neutrality now this sounds good and it probably is good if anybody pays attention to it, to it which they won't but tom wheeler is a terrible terrible man <laughs> and in my opinion this is simply his last lap through the revolving door so he doesn't care anymore he's done he just wants some goodwill to leave with at least we know what's uh, goodwill, or at least we know what's on his conscience. You know, if you guys don't recall, uh, John Oliver referred to him as, I think, the dingo. It's like, uh, you know, he's a formal, former cable industry lobbyist who, through the revolving door, was put into power as the FCC chairman. But then I guess he turned on his masters or whatever and actually did try to do some good in his career, which is appreciated. But, uh, you and know, it, he's on his way out. It doesn't make up for those previous <laughs> 10 or 15 revolutions, though. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's great, yeah. We we'll take what we can get, but we need these kind of people out of power. <laughs> well, we need these kind of people out of power and not something worse in power. I mean, <laughs> it's like, oh, we've replaced Stalin with Hitler. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> gonna, there's going to be a bunch of comments like, "Correction, Stalin was way worse." <laughs> Uh, speaking of uh, thing, you know, lawmakers behaving badly, uh, Virginia has a broadband deployment act that is going to kill municipal broadband. This shows you what people like Wheeler do when they are being paid by these companies. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is before the, the change of conscience comes. They're literally passing legislation to try and prevent because a lot of small towns have figured out, hey, let's do our own internet. It's going to be cheaper for everybody. We'll make a little money and it, it draws people to the town. It's a very attractive thing. Well, they don't like that. <laughs> yeah, they want to sell you the crappy, out-of-date copper uh, infrastructure for two or three times what it's worth and just sort of milk that for every penny. But it's not its not even really usable anymore. I mean, if your internet goes out every time the wind blows or every time it rains or, uh, you know, and the infrastructure has not been replaced, what choice do you have but to sort of take matters into your own hands and do it? We've seen farmers do that. We've seen rural communities in Vermont do that. We, we see that sort of all over America. And here in Virginia... It's like, oh, we need to make sure that the government does not help people do that. They must fight. You know, they have to go through all the bureaucracy and, and all of the stuff. And there's just no, individuals just can't do that easily. They can't navigate that easily. It goes way further than not help them. This actively fights them at every step of the way. It yeah. creates layers and layers of regulations that you, if you get it wrong, you're just done. Yeah. And it also sets this crazy rule that if, an, an incumbent ISP already has 10 megabit by one megabit. <laughs> you can't do it because that's good enough, according to them. Uh, 10 by one. Just, which is pretty much, I think pretty much the whole country's got that. Yeah. Well, uh, there are a lot of places, uh, there are a lot of places that say that you have that, but there are a lot of edge cases too. They're like, well, we've got 10 by one at the main highway, but your, your house is 2000 feet from the main highway. Sorry, you're going to get 768k or well, they're probably the argument would be well, like 10 percent has it, so yeah, yeah, yeah. This this that's, is this is uncalled for. It's bad. So if you're in Virginia, do everything you can to 
call attention to this and destroy it. <laughs> and it's another notch for the law is named the exact opposite of what it is. Oh, yeah. So when you see the Freedom and Democracy for All Citizens <laughs> Act, it's actually like, let's put everybody in the gulag in, you know, whatever, corporatocracy, I don't know, something crazy. Well, Obama's on his way out, and uh, he's expanded surveillance powers on his way out. So if you communicate with anyone outside the country or your traffic gets routed outside the country <laughs> for whatever reason, like if you live near Canada, uh, <laughs> this the stuff that the NSA was collecting can now be shared with pretty much every other department. And it used to be that they had to like file a request and they'd say, well, maybe you should have this, maybe you shouldn't, but now they can just search it. Yes, and there's no redaction. There's no any kind of right. privacy. It's like, so if the NSA has unencrypted recordings, like international phone call recordings of every international phone call that ever existed, that's now available to several different law enforcement agencies in its true and original form. And there have already been, not necessarily this, but so many ways of data collection that have led to uh, prosecutions just based on, hey, we found this out. We're not supposed to know it, but based on knowing it, we can make an arrest and lie about it. And it works pretty much every time. The term you want to Google there is parallel construction. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, so this will just be another tool for that. Yay, technology subverting citizenry. <laughs> uh, uh, so a lawyer has been swept up by a Stingray device. Speaking of parallel construction, <laughs> Stingray is one of the most common ways of doing this. You know, like they, they do a Stingray. They find out what's on your phone. They're not supposed to know that. And then they find another reason to make the arrest. That's super, super common. And search your phone. Yeah. Stingrays, if you're not familiar, if you've been living under a rock, they are a fake cell tower. That So you, you know, the, the, the surveillance van drives up, they turn on the Stingray, and then all of the phones in the area are like, ooh, a new cell tower that has way stronger and better signal than all of the other cell tower, towers in the area, even if you happen to be standing right next to one. And so all the phones will immediately associate to that tower. And then at that point, you've basically, you don't really, I mean, it's not, it's a little less straightforward than that. We're going to talk about that a little later in the program. But uh, the phones being associated to that tower mean that all of the traffic can be observed. And because the cellular radios are, tend to be implemented in an inherently insecure way on the cell phone, you can do all sorts of fun things. There's, it provides a vector for installing malware or, um, you know, malicious, other malicious software, depending on other factors. Uh, but in terms of like surveillance and data collection and just being able to see uniquely identifiable um, componentry of the phone and being able to obtain subscriber information from the carrier, all of those things are possible with, with Stingray. So that's and more and more, scary. more and more commonly, if you go to a large gathering of people, uh, if you go to Trump's inauguration, guaranteed. You, there will be a stingray or two there. Any kind of political protest, anything like that, they're just driving these things up and, you know, turning them on just to... <laughs> Build a file. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, Prove you were there, if nothing else. Well, the article says, you know, has like, how does the lawyer know that a stingray was used? And it's not really, like, super clear on that. I have a guess about that. There is a uh, piece of Android software that um, will help you detect stingrays. And again, we're not, we're not positive, but that's how he did this, but somehow he's not telling and it's smart not to tell him because yeah. they, they would patch it in the meantime and be like, no, 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 yeah. that's fine. We totally are a cellular provider. But this software tries to, uh, to alert you when you switch to one of these suspicious uh, cell towers. Interestingly, it does require a rooted phone. Um, my suggestion to you would be to obtain an old Android device and run this on an old Android device that doesn't have anything else on it. Doesn't it also require a Qualcomm Yes, chip? Qualcomm so, chipset. Yeah, it's pretty specific, but if you have that <laughs> unicorn device, then you might want to check this out. Or just buy a device just for the purpose, which is probably what the lawyer did, and, would uh, be my guess. But keep in mind that by downloading this device, you're probably going on another list. <laughs> yeah, the, this was probably written by the intelligence agencies themselves. <laughs> <laughs> there did used to be several... Uh, like several uh, open source packages because you can access the uh, the radio directly on some phones, um, but uh, there's there are some there's there are some caveats and we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit later. <laughs> so in other security news, in, in in terms of law enforcement behaving badly, I guess Cloudflare, which is a 
provider that provides uh, proxy service, DD DDoS protection, um, and other types of internet services for a whole bunch of customers has been served in NSL for the three years, almost four years, 2013. So national security letter. Yeah, national security letter. Now, if you're not familiar, a national security letter is a situation where a judge basically decides that you have a customer or you have some information that is so important to national security that it basically has to be treated top secret. And so the only person that is allowed to know about your NSL letter is a lawyer. And so uh, that, you know, gives them I, the NSL letter can be used to get access to a provider systems to be able to spy on people. In the case of LavaBit with uh, Edward Snowden, uh, LavaBit was Edward Snowden's email provider. They got a, a national security letter. And what they wanted in the national security letter was full and complete access to every customer of the subscriber through the encryption, encryption key. And so Cloudflare <laughs> voiced some similar concerns, uh, even going so far as to go to Capitol Hill, like Cloudflare's lawyer actually went to Capitol Hill and to discuss the matter. And uh, I just I have to read this because this is the most amazing this is the most amazing thing ever. This anecdote from Cloudflare lawyer Carter is particularly telling of the gag order's negative impact on the firm's policy and advocacy effects. In early 2014, I met with a key Capitol Hill staffer who worked on issues related to counterterrorism, homeland security, and the judiciary. I had a conversation where I explained how Cloudflare values transparency, due process of law, and expressed concerns that national security letters are unconstitutional tools of convenience rather than necessity. The staffer dismissed my concerns and expressed that Cloudflare's position on NSLs was a product of needless worrying, speculation, and misinformation. The staffer noted it would be impossible for an NSL to be issued against Cloudflare since the services our company provides expressly did not fall within the jurisdiction of the NSL statute. The staffer went so far as to open a copy of the U.S. Code and read from the statutory language to make her point. Because of the gag order... I had to sit in silence, implicitly confirming the point that was in the mind of the staffer. At the time, I knew for certainty that the FBI's interpretation of the statute diverged from hers and presumably that of her boss. This is 1984. This is literally like a passage from 1984. This, this thing happened in 1984. Yeah, the, the truth in court is supposed to be unassailable. If you have the truth behind you, then you don't have to worry. But here... Revealing the truth is literally a crime. <laughs> One lawyer talking to another lawyer, and it's like, no, that's not, we we'd, we'd never use the law that way. That's not what that means. And it's like, that's, what? There was a similar thing where somebody tried to sue the NSA when the data collection thing first came out. And their defense in that case was, yeah, we might have violated the Constitution here, but you shouldn't have ever known about it. So you can't sue us. Like, that was literally the legal defense. <laughs> and I think it worked. Uh, but this, you know, it's, it's a great example of why secret courts, are, if you look back through the history of civilization, most of before the fall of the great civilizations, they had secret courts. <laughs> they're really bad. And they're, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a sign of the end times coming. You know? <laughs> I just, I can't, the mind reels here. I mean, I think this kind of thing is so frustrating for computer scientists and and other logical minded people, because, you know, it's not necessarily the case that, that the law should be applied as universally like a compiler. Like, you know, it's like your C++ compiler is suddenly going to treat curly brackets a little bit differently in, in certain edge cases or in certain situations, but at least it would behave consistently. But because I guess this is an inherently analog medium and it's so all over the place. I think that's why this kind of thing is so frustrating for for computer scientists is because it's like, just tell us the rules, just tell us what the rules are, apply the rules evenly and consistently, and we'll move on. And I get that, you know, law is analog, and you can't really necessarily do that. You have to, you know, there has to be like human spirit or the human condition there. But who would look at this and say this is legit? Like, I mean, it's a borderline, it, it seems like a borderline conspiracy, because, you know, who, you know, oh, the interpretation here is different than the interpretation somewhere else. And it's just, it's really eye opening, but it's also damn scary. Yeah. Well, again, secrecy was never meant to be a part of the legal system. That's, it wasn't created for that. And they didn't plan for that. <laughs> and this, all these new security, there are people trying to sell you security. That's what gets us. If you look at one overarching theme to all this, it's somebody's trying to sell you security. 
No one can sell you security. <laughs> I, and we talk about, it's like, we get a lot of comments actually. It's like, hey, you should do a video on how we set up a VPN and encryption and how we can be, how we can be secure. There's no such thing. Any, <laughs> if you take any good, I'm sure when you took your first network security class, they said, you want a secure computer? Boot it up, unplug the network, turn, disable the wireless, remove it if possible, lock the door and leave the room. That's a secure computer. Otherwise, you're never going to get one. Although they've been, you know, the uh, the spooks have been real creative with that one. They've got ultra high frequency stuff. They can, <laughs> That's right. they can change the frequency that the span the fan spins at, or like a hard drive access pattern, and it, you know, it leaks electromagnetic noise. So I mean, even that's not really super secure if you really, really want to get neckbeard pedantic about it. I guess you have to turn it off. Yeah, you have to turn it off. Like <laughs> turn it off, shut it down. Make sure it can't be read from outside the door. <laughs> well, Trump's going to fix this. He's got a new cybersecurity <laughs> czar named Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy Giuliani. Now, of course, you've you've all heard of that name. He is the, one of the worst authoritarian scumbags to ever exist in this country. Uh, but he's a he's an expert on security, right? Cybersecurity. I mean, he's got a company. Hmm. Got to know something, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> turns out the company website may have some problems. Uh, expired SSL. No HTTPS. Uses Joomla. Uses. PHP 5.4 point something, uh, Joomla 3.1.1, FreeBSD 6 released in 2008. <laughs> so many open ports. Uh... You know, we've seen a few uh, Joomla sites in our time that have uh, <laughs> hackers have had their way with. Not real secure at the best of times. And this is clearly not the best of times for this website. So uh, th it's it's funny that they their public facing website that advertises them is one of the most insecure, horrible piece of garbage websites that anybody's ever seen. In my mind, this strongly suggests that they're probably not in the business that they claim to be because well, they're in, they're in the business of lending his name and his celebrity <laughs> to bids for jobs. You know, we know how that goes as well. Yeah. So it's sad. Now, I don't expect Trump to know any. I mean, Trump, you know, he's, he's not a technological guy, clearly. <laughs> but it is sad that he's buying into, you know, the, just putting names into these offices. Like, oh, clearly that guy, he's the mayor of New York. He's got his stuff together as far oh, as, yeah. you know, technology and security goes. He'll be the guy. Oh, you need a you need a basement dweller. You need somebody like Richmond from the IT crowd or something like that. That's the guy that you need on your cybersecurity team. It's just. But he is going to be the guy. <laughs> so. Get ready for that. <laughs> oh my lord, what is going on? Maybe, uh, maybe everybody, everybody's right, and Trump really is in league with the Russians, and this is his move to like neuter our defenses <laughs> against the Russian hackers. <laughs> like, don't worry, Vlad, you're gonna have no problems getting in. So, WhatsApp recently had a vulnerability discovered, but this is more nuanced than that. So, it turns out that if you're a server administrator, you can get to the unencrypted WhatsApp messages. Like, you can it sort of get to them as a man in the middle process. This is also still, though, kind of a developing story. Uh, Facebook says this is a non issue because you would have to have server access to do this. So, this is not like Russians can, unless Russians have access to Facebook servers, would be able to get in and read encrypted WhatsApp messages. But then I'm forced to remember the national security letters. Yeah. Stuff. And you mentioned Facebook. Facebook owns WhatsApp. They acquired them like a couple of years ago. So a lot of people are downplaying this and saying, no, no, this is as designed. You would have <laughs> to have collusion with Facebook in order to unencrypt these messages. Well, do you huh. think that's going to be hard to get if you're, <laughs> you know, in the government or so, maybe even, a, you know, some sort of uh, corporate partner, you know, some kind of situation like that? You cannot trust Facebook to secure your data. Certainly. Well, and these companies have a have an interest in multinational business. So right. it's not just America; it's also Russia and China and other countries. I mean, I think uh, WhatsApp isn't it the number one messaging thing in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. So they, there's been a lot of stories about terrorists using it to <laughs> coordinate like, oh, and encrypted. stuff like that. Mm, you know? so I know, I know it's, yeah, terrorists. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm saying these are governments that don't mind spending a few dollars to figure out who doesn't like them. Well, I mean. We, it's. I think this week or last week we also saw like the New York Times, uh, so, or China demanded that Apple remove some app from the App Store, and they did. Yeah. So I mean, is it is it really far away to imagine that 
you know, China might demand access to Chinese user encrypted messages. I mean, we saw right. that the other messaging system in the stories a few weeks ago about how it was quietly rewriting group text messages. In, yeah, and was, that's that's a lot of users. So if you have a me an app and you want a lot of users and it's ad driven and that kind of thing, China saying, hey, you want to lose a billion users or you want to give us this information? You know, <laughs> what decision are you going to make? So when we talk about things like um, uh, stingrays and and the tools that are used to decrypt phones and you know steal sessions and and spy on users and that sort of thing, those are not actually made by law enforcement. Those are made by companies. One of those companies is Cellbrite, and they've had a security oopsie. It's also it's interesting to note here before we get into the story, these devices almost always come with non disclosure agreements. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. and that's not just we're not going to disclose how this technology works. We're not going to disclose that we use it. Yeah. So they are legally bound not to tell you how they got your cell phone information because of the contract with the security company that made the hardware that does it, which is incredible. <laughs> and they've made that argument before judges as well, going right, so yeah. far as to actually withdraw the evidence in a few cases where the judge was like, no, you've got to explain this, this you know, voodoo, black magic, whatever. And they're like, well, we're just going to withdraw that evidence. This case is not important enough to, to really worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Like, Serving justice is not that big a deal <laughs> if it threatens our uh, illegal spying. <laughs> uh, Cellbrite. 900 gigabytes of data from Cellbrite. This is customers, source code, I guess, a whole bunch of things. Uh, interestingly, it's not any of the seized information. So that's the, that's the real terrifying <laughs> uh, scenario here is cops are pulling data from phones randomly or in mass, and it's getting stored somewhere, and then somebody steals it who's not law enforcement. <laughs> That's not what's going on here. No. But you have to think that that could be a reality because something like this happened. Yeah. Not if the, the company that sells so the company that sells the goods. Uh, this is this is definitely not a good situation as far as uh, as far as I mean, I just. This, this whole thing is a mess. I, it just doesn't seem like anybody that really knows technology is involved in any step of the way. It just seems like a bunch of people that don't really know how technologies work and how the, how much they're opening Pandora's box is really a problem. I mean, remember the whole FBI, Apple encryption key, whatever, uh, had Cellbrite you know, been given the encryption key or had Cellbrite have the technology to do that, all of a sudden every iPhone on the planet would have to be updated to mitigate whatever attack would be created out of this information being stolen from Cellbrite. And that would happen overnight. That would be trivial. Yeah. It's like, oh, you got the encryption key? How easy is it to just yeah. deploy and, and do everything? The other thing to worry about is 900 gigabytes of data probably has pretty much everything, don't you think? So are, do some people now have the ability to build these on their own outside of law enforcement? So now can anybody... <laughs> replicate this technology. Anybody build a stingray? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to see it on Hackaday. You saw it here first. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we had open source stingrays and that was just like you, everybody knew that everybody was listening, that would be an interesting world. One of the ways that security on the internet improved in general was the fact that there is so much sort of Wild West chaos going on on the internet. You have to have really hardened security or you're going to lose all your stuff. The cellular network is still pretty much a walled garden, so the security there is not as important. So if the the cellular network were more open and there were more, it was more of a wild west of devices, it probably would improve the security for everybody. It's an interesting thought. Well, Windows 10 is getting an update to add user privacy controls, maybe. <laughs> of course, it's a, sort of a Fisher-Price version. Of course, like... <laughs> Do you want to be spied on? Yes, no, maybe? <laughs> Sometimes, but not every time. Uh, I played around with an early version of this, and it seemed to be a web control panel. So, like, if you've got, like, the Microsoft account and you log in, and it's like, here's all the stuff that I know, and you can turn off stuff from there. But this looks like they're adding it into the operating system, and I don't, I'm not sure that it was available in an earlier build. So this is something we're going to keep an eye on, something that's going to shake out. But if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can keep an eye on it. Or you can just switch to Linux and head off that problem. By no means expect privacy after you turn these off. <laughs> it's like, we're just going to anonymize the data that we send rather than tracking it back to you. It'll be fine. Yeah, don't trust them. Well, there's a fun, exciting project on Hackaday when we talk about all this, and that is this DIY 
GSM cell phone. So this is based on a Raspberry Pi Zero, but you can order about $50 of components and actually get a, uh, a GSM compatible cell phone with a screen and you know there's the componentry and, and that sort of thing. And this project is exciting for many, many reasons. Um, not the least of which is that the hardware and operating system is open. It's open source, which is nice. The cellular radio is isolated from the system. Uh, something that a lot of people don't realize is that in most cell phones, the hardware implementation, the cellular radio, is able to read and write from system memory. This is a huge problem for security conscious people. Uh, if you don't trust your cellular provider to not snoop around inside your phone when you're not looking. Um, with modern Android, you know, encrypted by default, you encrypt your, your data store, the encryption key is there somewhere. Theoretically, the encryption key is stored in a secure enclave, but the actual system memory is still not encrypted. So if there are encryption keys floating around system memory, those could be snooped on by the, by the cellular radio. Um, if the encryption key for the overall system flash happens to make it to system memory for whatever reason, if it's not in the secure enclave, then um, that could be recovered by the cellular radio as well. I don't know if these are things we should be concerned about in, in terms of like nation state attacks. Maybe based on all these other, I mean, all this, this news would make you super paranoid. It's crazy. Um, but this Raspberry Pi, it's isolated. The radio has no capability to read and write from system memory on the Raspberry Pi, which is nice. It's isolated. So in that regard, it's actually, it's actually a pretty cool deal. And one thing to keep in mind um, if you look at the picture of this thing, it's it's pretty much just a PCB with yeah. you know with buttons on it. You get arrested or stopped in frisk, and this is in your pocket. You will go to jail. Yeah, guaranteed. Yeah, it's like oh, I want to fly somewhere. It's like this looks like a detonator. No, that's, <laughs> that's not going on a plane. Don't even have it in your your luggage. Yeah. Now I don't I th I, th I don't think this guy is thinking out out of the box enough. I think you know it's like yeah, cell phone, whatever. I think it should just be a module. Like you know you've got your cellular radio, isolate it and provide TCP, provide some sort of voice connection, an analog voice connection, or you can just you know use whatever, or maybe a Bluetooth connection. You run the software on your laptop, you can run the software, something very simple, but I don't think that you need a full keypad. I don't think that you need a direction pad. I don't think you need any of that. I think you could end up with a very small module that really just has the SIM radio, and the SIM radio is, is basically a glorified media converter, so that you don't, you can use another cell phone, you can use an Android cell phone, you could use anything, but you've basically isolated the cellular radio from the rest of everything else. And how you get the, the voice out of that, whether it's digital or analog or whatever, uh, you control. And I think that's the, that's the appealing possibility with this device. Yeah, and it doesn't, I mean, it's not going to integrate with any kind of app store. So, I mean, it'll run the, the Raspbian apps. But on that tiny display with no touch screen, I mean, voice and text, those are the least used items on <laughs> everybody's phone these days, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's just, I need to be able to get a hold of you immediately. Okay, sounds good. Well, you know, while we're worried about, you know, system architecture of cell phones and which things have <laughs> memory access to things, the normies are worried about whether or not their cell phone has a headphone jack. Oh, the poor normies. Well, they're not worried about it. <laughs> so when Apple dropped the headphone jack, there was all of this outrage, but it was a, a tempest in a, in a teapot, you know, <laughs> and Apple correctly assumed that these morons will just buy wireless headsets, which by the way, Beats is one of the biggest manufacturers of wireless headsets. So, you know, I'm sure they made some sales there. And <laughs> uh, it turns out two thirds of holiday headphone purchases were wireless. <laughs> wow, yeah, so here's the Fortune article. So wireless headphones, I guess, didn't really matter. Yeah, people uh, were willing to pay to overcome the purposely removed feature. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta wonder what what's gonna go next. <laughs> well, I guess the dongle was the one after that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's they've like... already struck again. <laughs> We're gonna have a phone that doesn't have any ports whatsoever. It charges <laughs> wirelessly. <laughs> I can't. That might not be terrible. I don't know. Could seal it. Sounds gonna sound terrible though. But until you get in that situation where, I mean, right now you can charge your phone in an emergency situation in a lot of different places. True. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Apple. Uh, well, MIT has invented a new type of sort of 3D-ish printed graphene that is the strongest material on Earth. It is still graphene, but the uh, 
Innovation is the geometric pattern in which it is built, the 3D pattern. So it's kind of like a, you know, a bridge structure that bears more weight because of its geometry. This is exciting for a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is I think that this type of material is probably going to give us um, space travel because this material is light enough we can get it into orbit and being stronger than steel, it's going to react very well with some of the dangers of space like micrometeorites and you know super high speed projectile projectiles that are you know headed for spacecraft. You know your spacecraft coated in about six or ten inches of this stuff is going to dramatically increase the chances that uh, you know a pea sized piece of rock moving at like 0.9 c is not going to completely destroy the uh, the space vessel. Although it'll probably still do quite a bit of damage. It's also porous, which is good for certain construction needs like bridges and you know I mean you might. <laughs> I don't know how expensive it is to make, but you might like put it under your driveway. Or it is. <laughs> it's a great drainage and it's never going to wear out. <laughs> uh, so that was exciting. That's a lot of fun. If you guys can think of any other applications of a super strong, lightweight uh, material, let us know. 5%, I think, the density. So You can make race cars out of it, but nobody's going to be driving cars <laughs> in 10 years, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> YouTube is launching some new features, something called Super Chat. Super Chat is basically donations. Yes. Now, if you if you've ever been a Twitch viewer or a streamer, you know that donations are a huge part of the Twitch platform. And it's it's almost I don't know, it's like a cultural thing with Twitch. People just love to donate. And YouTube, the crowd, the YouTube crowd just never really got in on it. No. So I guess it's this too is hard. their way. Now, in this case, uh, when you donate, it's gonna pin your comment to the top of the chat. So it's like guaranteed attention basically yep i guess that's neat although you could have a lot of fun with it if you were a troll yeah <laughs> but then again you know like if you're gonna give me two dollars to insult me i think yeah. i'm okay with that that could work yeah i mean <laughs> i can deal with that now we can't crap on donations because when we started level one techs about a third of our Starting budget was Twitch donations. Thank so, you. <laughs> good job, Twitch people. Yeah. But a lot of the, you look at a lot of the equipment behind this camera, Twitch donations. <laughs> Yay. And now thanks patrons too. So Yeah. <laughs> Europe calls for mandatory kill switch robots. Yeah, they want every robot to be built with a switch that can turn it off. But what was far more interesting to me is they're starting to really think about this whole like, Robots taking our jobs. <laughs> so they also want robot insurance, liability robot insurance, just in case your robot goes crazy and kills somebody. But they also are thinking about taxing the robot workers, huh. which is really interesting. A lot of people talk about universal income, how are we going to pay for that? It might be taxed robot workers. <laughs> Tax the labor. Uh, the genie might already be out of the bottle on that. I mean, how do you define a robot? Because there's already a ton of robots in the workforce is it level of complexity is it independence i mean it seems yeah. like what classifies for the tax would be it, it just it could open up a whole world of complication and it could also open up uh like we've talked about the revolving door yeah. and this isp stuff so think about amazon has a lobbyist who says that its robots are grandfathered in or they don't count <laughs> for whatever reason but you're trying a startup that uses robots and your robots have to pay taxes. <laughs> that's the kind of thing that crushes an economy. Wow. Yeah. That's gonna, it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. The European Union, it's, it, they're, they're so progressive about a lot of things. But there are some other things where I just I really I scratch my head. And it's like, what are they attempting to do here? Because it doesn't seem like this will end well. Well, it sounds good, especially if you're somebody with a job that's at risk of being lost to a robot. But yeah, there are smarter people than the lawmakers, which isn't a huge stretch, who are just sitting there thinking, ah, how can I twist this to my advantage? And they will inevitably do it. <laughs> well, in science news, uh, the first person to die of a superbug resistant to everything has killed somebody in Nevada. Yeah, this is uh, pretty worrying. I mean, we've got such a huge spectrum of antibiotics. And that we had a couple that were like, only use these if you literally can't kill it with fire. <laughs> and because there's, you know, they have side effects and stuff like that. Well, those aren't working anymore. No, nope. this is not good. This is very bad. 
But we're going to get rid of our uh, national health care plan. So <laughs> that'll fix it, probably. This is the kind of thing, you know, this is like uh, that Crichton novel. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of thing where it's just you can't fight it and it, it wipes out half the civilization. <laughs> Yay, hospitals. Uh, you know, Russia had like retrovirals or something that they used for this kind of inoculation. I wonder if those will come come in vogue. They they attack <laughs> bacteria with viruses. Maybe that's how we got the zombie outbreak. With, with this neo McCarthyism, can you imagine if somebody was like, "Let's introduce Russian drugs to the market"? <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought about that angle. Mm. That's gonna be a mess. Have you got a VR headset? There's a new thing, Gravity Sketch. You should play with that. It looks cool as hell. So yeah. it's it's like a sketch program for your VR headset. A modeling. Modeling, yeah. So <laughs> it's like Minecraft, but. <laughs> For real. But for VR. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of the demo that Microsoft did with the HoloLens, but did anybody ever actually get a HoloLens? They're like five grand. They look cool, but I just, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. To me, this is like VR. I'm not sure about VR gaming. I'm sure it's going to be cool. Uh, the price is going to have to come way down for it to be competitive, but people who can use it for this kind of thing, if that can really improve their workflow, then that could sell VR. And that could be a really cool use for it. Hmm. Well, in other news, do you like hot peppers? You're probably going to live longer. Uh, some study finds a, <laughs> an association between eating hot peppers and decreased mortality. I would love to see that they did the annual like list of insane studies we spent government money on <laughs> this year. And oh, man, the social justice stuff, like they're getting so much money to study. <laughs> like how does gender identification affect frogs? <laughs> Uh, this sounds like something like that to me. <laughs> well, just your reminder of a correlation is not necessarily causation. Uh, we wanted to show you another, you know, correlation here, which is Nick Cage movies versus drownings and more strange but spurious cor correlations. This is really great. So here's a graph of U.S. spending on science, space, and technology, and suicides by hanging, <laughs> strangulation, and suffocation. So clearly the impetus here is that we should stop spending on science, space, and technology. And I think we're going to get that <laughs> for at least the next four years. <laughs> My favorite one that it wasn't in this list is uh, murder and ice cream. <laughs> murder and ice cream. Ice cream sales, yeah. Because it's warm weather, you know, so people get angrier when they're hot look at how well this one tracks number of people who drowned by falling in a pool versus films nicholas cage appeared in <laughs> i mean look at this this is i mean this is like perfect it's you <laughs> fall into the pool the same number of people fall into pools but when you get to the bottom you're like i just can't i'm just gonna stay I can't here summon the courage to swim up <laughs> because of those stupid nicholas cage movies. they weren't all bad <laughs> Per capita consumption of sour cream with motorcycle riders killed in a non collision <laughs> transport accident. So what this what this really represents is it's easier than ever to access scientific data and to write little scripts that will find correlations. <laughs> I mean, I, some of these look like they have a confidence interval of like you know five percent or something. This is completely insane. That's pretty much it for the news this week. We thought we'd try to leave you on a note with a bit of levity. Um, we've got some exciting content coming up. Finally going to have some content for the Linux channel this week, I think, I hope, pretty sure. So that'll be really good. And if you didn't see our storage video, you should totally check that out because we had a lot of fun making that. And we're not going to do that every time. That's going to be like a once a month kind of thing probably. We're just as the inspiration hits. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. See you guys. See you next week. <laughs>